Welcome to the Legislative News Update. I'm Tim Boyum. This week we're here with Wake County Senator Josh Stein, a Democrat. Good to see you, sir. Thank Th you and welcome back. Thanks, Tim. Look forward to it. Uh, we've had some significant weather this session. It's, it's a slow start for, compared to previous years, huh? Uh, this is my fourth term and this is far and away the slowest uptake we've ever had. Now, the weather has been partly responsible for it, clearly, but um, I think we've done two substantive bills in a month and I'm ready to get to work and hope that we will for the people. The Republicans got off to a fast start last the last by any. Why, why do you think you think they're still trying to feel each other out with a new House Speaker? I think that's part of it. I, frankly, I think Tillis was part of it. Tillis was really into saying we're going to be out of here by X date, and then we would miss it by a month or something. But he he was a very um, schedule driven person. Uh, it's more, consultant management. <laughs> more and uh, Senator Speaker Moore and Senator uh, Berger seem to be more about the substance of the work substance of the work as opposed to any calendar of the work. It's very early, but c can you tell a difference with the new speaker and how the relationship is between the House and the Senate? It's too early. I, I can't tell. I, I know Speaker Moore and respect him a, a great deal, and so I'm hoping that he'll bring a level of professionalism and a, a level of deliberation on the House side. Uh, I know the House, they always cut off debate, and I think that's not healthy for democracy. Um, so I hope he, he brings an openness to the process uh, and we'll see how he, how he serves in that role. A lot of people are saying this session is not going to be necessarily potentially about you know, major tax reform, major initiatives like we've seen before. Uh, tweaking, I think, is a term I've used a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. Do you get the sense that that's what this session is going to be? I think so. I, you know, there are some big issues, whether it's education, Medicaid, economic development, uh, but I don't know that there's a consensus among the governor, the House Republicans, the Senate Republicans, let alone the legislative Democrats. And so because I think the first term or two when the Republicans were in power, they were of one mind as to what steps to take. Uh, I think that they've t checked off their sort of ideological boxes of those things that they were all in accord on. And now they're really thorny issues. You know, how do you improve the Medicaid system? How do you improve public education? How do you make North Carolina attractive to bring in jobs? And there's not simple answers to those questions. And I think that the fact that they're struggling with that, uh, which is not necessarily an unhealthy thing, is partly to explain why we're not going so fast right now. Now that we, we are a couple terms into Republican leadership, how do you see yourself as a Democrat fitting into that? Has it changed as we've gone through the years here? Not really. It's pretty shut. Uh, the, the Republicans pretty much shut the Democrats out of the process, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I will commend uh, Senator Berger and Senator Apodaca for this. They do allow us, when issues come to the floor, to have full opportunity to debate. We, we're not cut off when it comes to debating the issues, and that, that, that is a positive thing, and I, I commend them for that. Uh, the, Everything up until that point, however, there's very little deliberation across the aisle. Whether it's what issues to talk about or how to approach issues, the idea that they would invite us in and say, you know, what are some of your ideas on this issue of Medicaid or what are some of your ideas on economic development or tax policy or education policy? It just doesn't happen and it's unfortunate. And uh, look, I know Democrats, when they were in power, they ran things and ran the agenda, but I can remember very distinctly, it was my first term when Democrats were in power, one of the big issues we had was ethics reform. And we sat down, the, there were about five or six Democratic senators, and this was at Senator um, uh, Bass Knight's directive, engage Senator Berger, engage his lieutenants, and work on this issue and come up with something together. And we came up with a bipartisan ethics reform package. And that just hasn't happened. And it, it is frustrating as somebody who believes I don't have all the right answers, but I also believe they don't have all the right answers. And where we can get the best result is when we sit down and hash things out. And that can either be in private or can happen in committee. Uh, and to, I mean, just the perfect example, this bill that came up this week and um, on allowing magistrates to discriminate in the performance of their public duties. One of Democratic Senator and J2 committee, I'm not on the committee, but I was there watching, said, you know, can we work on this one piece? And the bill sponsor said, no, it's a four square document and we're very content with the way it is. And that's not a, a constructive way to do public policy, in my opinion. 
do you think it's just because they, they want to do their ideas and they don't care or that they weren't in power for so long they feel like they need to push through things and they're still learning the process? Or, I mean, is it deliberate, do you think? I think it's, I think it's clearly <coughs> deliberate. I think it's that they have a two-to-one ratio of seats. They have a super majority. They're at 34 and we're at 16. And they do not need a single Democratic vote to pass a bill. And for that reason, they don't care to hear Democratic uh, views on matters. Uh, and it's not like Democrats are monolithic anyway. So I, I think it just comes fundamentally down to power and their perception of it and the f view that we're not part of the process. You brought it up, so we'll talk about it now. I was going to talk about it later, but the magistrate's bill that yeah. did come through this week. Uh, you have a legal background yourself, obviously. First, do you think it's constitutional? I think that it uh, is, it's an open question. I think it's likely unconstitutional. I will compliment the bill drafters for being artful in the way they've tried to, to draft discrimination so that it's not as clearly unconstitutional as it could be if it was drawn in a, a different way. So yes, it's artful, but I, here's the deal. A person, a couple, it could even be, it could be a black and white couple, it could be a Jewish Christian couple. They can walk in to get their marriage performed civilly by the state, by a magistrate, and the magistrate, whose, do, whose job it is to do it, who could have just married some people that morning, can say, you know what, I'll be right back. And then they go and talk to the uh, chief district court judge and say, I would like to stop performing civil ceremonies for the state for the next six months. I recuse myself. That's offensive. It's offensive to the citizenry who have their right to get married just like anyone else does. And uh, for that reason, I think it's unconstitutional. Senator Berger said, he, I, if I remember right, said he, this will not lead to anybody not getting married. Obviously, there are some counties where there's not a lot of you know, people that would be able to do this. Do, do you buy that? Do you think that's possible? I think it is possible, although in counties where the magistrates all opt out, it then falls on the chief district court judge, who, by the way, has a job of his or her own, which is not performing ceremonies. That's why we have magistrates do it. So to the extent now that the chief district court judge has to become a magistrate, they're no longer able to do their other job. Uh, so my hope is, is that no citizen in any county is denied the right to get married. But here's the deal. When you work for the government and you serve the public, you serve all the public. You don't get to serve only the public, the select few whom you like or agree with or comport with your religious views. It's called public service, not selective service. And to start this process in this one instance with this one set of employees for this one service performing a marriage, there, there's no reason why we should draw the line there. Um, I mean, you could then have a true believer person, uh, someone who's very committed to their faith in the Department of Revenue who processes tax returns. And then they see a lesbian couple filing a return married jointly filing and say, no, I can't do that. I can't give, do this because it offends my religious beliefs. Look, you can have whatever belief you have, and I respect people's religious liberty profoundly. You believe it yourself, you go to a church, you go to a synagogue, you go wherever, and you practice that. But when you serve the public and you draw your salary from the public, everyone in the public, you have to be open for business. A DMV clerk cannot say, to a lesbian woman who wants to change her last name to that of her partner, you know, I'm sorry, I can't serve you because this offends my religious beliefs. No, that DMV person works for the state. The state has to serve the people, the taxpayers, and they cannot pick and choose who they deliver that service to. And that's what this bill sets up as a precedent. And once you've established that precedent, there's nowhere to draw the line. I mean a Muslim or Jewish person who works in a legislative cafeteria who doesn't eat pork. Are they allowed to say, I'm not going to serve someone, a senator, pork because it offends my religion? You can't have that happen. Otherwise, government ceases to, to function. And then it starts to get out where citizens start to feel that the state is judging them and there's no place for that. So do you think Will this issue likely get to the U.S. Supreme Court than anything? I mean, we're not the only state that's dealing with some of these issues. And some other states have dealt with bills that have allowed people cake, you know, other wedding 
folks to, to do it. I mean, does this end up being another Supreme Court issue? It will. Uh, it will. It will work its way through the court, whether it ultimately ends up in the Supreme Court or at a, a federal appellate level uh, court. I can't speak to that. Assuming it passes, obviously, too. And those are two different issues. One has to do with the state versus one has to do with the public, and they're both ripe for constitutional attack, although they're slightly different arguments. So I think that we'll see two different bills and there'll be two different lawsuits. But it's just more of the same. Here is the fundamental issue. We know it's going to get litigated. We know it's going to cost the state hundreds of thousands of dollars to defend this. And, and for what end? to shine a light on North Carolina as a state that refuses to move forward and say to the country, to the world, that we're open for business and we don't really, we want to be a hospitable open place so that if you're a talented young entrepreneur or you are a creative worker, come to North Carolina. That's not the signal this sends. This sends a signal that we can't let go of yesterday's fights, that we will continue to fight the social wars forever and bring these issues back to the fore when the state, frankly, I think, in large measure had moved on. There was just a poll that came out that said 70 percent of people in North Carolina, after gay marriage was legalized, said it's had no effect on my life whatsoever. And that includes a majority of Republicans. Let's let these social divisions heal. Let's not rip the scabs off and create these tensions and divisions. And let's not say to the world, we want to fight the old fights. Let's say to the world, we're a forward-looking state that wants to move forward. Of course, that debate will, another debate will erupt at the Supreme Court this summer when they take up the issue, although the arguments to be in spring, but there's no really easy way to transition away from that, so let's just go away okay. from it for a minute. Fair the enough. gas tax issue is something you guys have already taken up. We uh, did. <laughs> um, that was a very difficult vote for me because it was an omnibus bill. The, the bill had to do with a whole host of changes to the tax code, including uh, making some modifications to the, to the gas tax. There were pieces to the bill that I liked. There were pieces of the bill I didn't like. But at the end of the day, when you comes to vote and you have five seconds to vote, you have to vote yes or no. You don't get to pick and choose which parts of the bills there is. So I, I voted for that bill. And the primary reason I voted for that bill is because our state infrastructure is lagging and the state's investment in infrastructure is lagging. It's getting less and less every year. And what this does, is, this bill does, is it sets a floor that says, okay, we're going to lower the gas tax and allow it to fall, but at a certain point, we're just going to set a floor to ensure that it doesn't keep falling and we keep falling further and further behind. Our roads, our bridges, our ports, our airports, they'll fall further and further behind, making North Carolina less economically competitive. That was too high a price for me to pay, so I voted for the bill for that reason. Now, it had provisions in there that make it taxable event for North Carolina uh, homeowners who get uh, mortgage principal relief from their lender. It's a terrible policy and un really unfair to working class folks. It had a provision that didn't allow uh, matching the deductibility of um, tuition expenses for middle class families. Another terrible and short-sighted provision. It had uh, really a unproductive uh, provision that required the Department of Transportation to fire 500 people even though those services may be needed as more infrastructure work gets done. So there were many provisions I didn't like but at the end of the day what tipped the scale for me was for North Carolina to be competitive we have to have solid infrastructure, we have to have a talented education workforce and we have to have a quality of life that says uh, North Carolina is open to everyone. Now. We'll take a step forward on infrastructure on this bill, and then the, the next week we take a step back by signaling to American businesses and entrepreneurs that we're wanting to rehash the social wars of the past. Um, so it's been a slow start. We've had a couple big bills. One of them I thought uh, in the main did right. The other one took us way off course. The House is likely, from what I'm hearing, going to put a cap on the gas tax again as part of their, I mean, do you think there's any appetite for that in the Senate? Uh, we'll see. Uh, it, that would be th that will be a negotiated point, and um, I wasn't sure that the Senate, the House, would pass this bill in its current form. When, when the Senate did, it was just I felt I had a duty for the future of the state to have ensure that we had adequate infrastructure. Part of the process of negotiations. I don't know about that. All right, we got to take a short break, uh, but stick with us. Much more with Senator Josh Stein here in Legislative News Update in just a moment.